In the spring of 1893, the city of Chicago opened one of the most spectacular exhibitions the world has ever seen. Built on over 600 acres near Lake Michigan, the Columbian Exposition World's Fair ushered in an era of brand new technology. The magical city was a monument to technological progress. It celebrated advances in industry and the arts. It introduced the world to Ferris wheels, ragtime, and hamburgers. But most importantly, it proclaimed the arrival of electricity as the world's new industrial energy. The monster machines that generated the power for this dazzling metropolis not only fueled the future of U.S. growth and modernization, it also gave Americans their first peek at the miraculous process that turned a dirty black rock into bright white light. And since then, the world has never been the same. The story of coal in Kentucky begins beneath the earth, where there are vast amounts of a mysterious black sedimentary rock composed mostly of carbon and hydrocarbons. The continental United States contains enormous underground deposits of this black rock that can be mined and burned to create electricity. And that's where the conflict arises in the story of this amazing energy source. Coal has entered a new era where its industrial and political dominance are in doubt, its environmental impacts are decried, and its economic benefit is questioned. When, when you look at where we are today and where we have been, uh, it has been energy that has got us there. And coal has been a big part of that equation. I am not against coal, except the part of coal that rips off the top of my mouth. More than almost any other state, Kentucky's current economy and politics and sociology are influenced by its geology. I'm conflicted, like any eastern Kentuckian that loves the mountains, but realizes the value of this resource. The issue isn't coal or the absence of coal. The issue is what do we do with that resource? The one thing that has been our, our strength, which is this cheap energy, is rapidly becoming a significant liability. But our appetite continues to grow. We must use coal as our primary energy source for the foreseeable future. Clean coal technology is an oxymoron. Coal is not clean. We have a responsibility to this generation and to the succeeding generations that we leave it in a better place that we found it. More and more people are asking, what is the cost of coal? Coal-powered plants like this one in central Kentucky produce the overwhelming majority of the state's electricity. A large plant can consume a daily average of 14,000 tons of coal. The generated heat sends 1,000 degree steam blasting through turbines that churn out more than 2,000 megawatts. And in fact, when you look at it, somewhere around 50% of the states uh, in the United States uh, get more than 50% of their energy. Uh, from uh, burning coal. So it's not just in Kentucky. Well, uh, there is an increased demand for coal globally, uh, largely because of the economic development of uh, 
developing countries, primarily China and India. Globally, the need for coal is only increasing. And especially when you look at, for example, the, the steel market in China, there's a greater, greater need for steel in these, in these kind of countries as they need these materials as they continue to develop. Uh, they're not producing steel in the same manner we do. They still use beehive ovens and very antiquated technology, but they use a tremendous amount of coal to create this steel. Coal burning plants like this one supply the United States with more than half its electricity. And for Kentucky, that figure rises dramatically to 92%. America is more dependent on coal today than at any time in our nation's history. The average American consumes about 20 pounds of the black rock daily. Getting the coal out of the earth is a complicated high-tech process that provides an almost magical convenience that we take for granted. Whenever we flip on the light switch, charge our laptops, or click a TV remote, most of us are effortlessly using energy generated from coal. I don't think people realize how much we depend on this source for electricity at this time, and we'll have to for several years into the future. I was a typical ignorant American. I think that, you know, until I was in my late 30s, I grew up in California, worked at Apple Computer, celebrated this sort of digital revolution but really gave no thought to where the electrons come from that power this sort of digital economy of ours. My daughter was in the sixth grade and came home one day, and of course she was familiar with coal and mining. And her teacher was talking about mining and environmental damage from mining, and he made the statement that he couldn't understand why we had to mine so much coal. Why couldn't we just use electricity? A lot of people know we have more miles of running water than any state but Alaska, so they figure, oh, we got a lot of hydropower. That's where our electricity comes from. Hydropower is in single digits. Coal is the 800-pound gorilla. But there are problems with the convenience of coal-powered electricity. First of all, simply getting the coal out of the ground can be a dirty, risky business. Second, burning that coal produces large amounts of ash, sulfur dioxide, and mercury. And today, with nearly 600 coal-fired power plants operating in the U.S., the release of climate-changing carbon dioxide amounts to as much as America's cars, trucks, buses, and planes combined. The demand to curtail and even eliminate CO2 from coal usage has never been greater. What has traditionally been our strong suit in terms of attracting industry is rapidly becoming a significant liability that we are going to have to deal with. And we are doing uh, to date a f very poor job of planning for the inevitability that, that carbon will be monetized, that the, the more of the full cost of energy will have to be realized in the product and uh, uh, in the electricity that's generated from it. As global economies grow and people in developing nations buy cars and appliances, they develop an appetite for inexpensive energy. Between 1950 and 2000, as the world population grew by roughly 140%, fossil fuel consumption increased by almost 400%. By 2030, the world's demand for energy is projected to more than double. Of all the fossil fuels on the planet, coal has become the world's fuel of choice. The main reasons, it's cheap and plentiful especially in America. Just how much coal lies beneath the surface of the United States is staggering. And it's here where the issues also begin to surface over the coal mined in Kentucky. And over a 20 year period, we're going to increase our appetite for uh, energy somewhere around 40% over what it is today. Many people compare the United States to the Saudi Arabia of coal. Now, we have 20, roughly 25% or so of the world's coal in this country. And Kentucky is the third leading producer of coal in the U.S. and for many years led the nation in production. But the role and impact it has within the state and its coal producing communities is being challenged by a growing number of voices. It's easy to believe that we can just sort of carry on in our merry way about um, you know how we're going to develop electricity in, in the future. We're just going to figure out ways to use this, that technology will solve this all for us, and we don't really have to change our lives, change how we think about energy. And in that sense, this whole promise of coal is 
a false promise because we are going to have to change. The nation, frankly, is, is quite comfortable getting along with other people's problems. And, and the fact that, uh, that Ap the Appalachian region has been turned into the nation's mineral colony is not something that upsets most people. They don't give it a, th a second thought where their energy comes from until you flip the switch and it's not there. Coal is not the only viable source of energy. And if we start, we learn to conserve and not use so much more than we actually need, we wouldn't need as much coal. We back away from coal, we could use solar and wind to supplement coal. We're not gonna get rid of coal, but f over 50% of, of our energy needs are supplied by coal now. Conservation is probably the biggest untapped energy source that we have. Uh, do we use too much? Do we consume too much? Yes, we do. We have a very inefficient uh, society, and that's one of the things I think that this country needs to work on to conserve our natural resources. Uh, if you look at, again, the world population, and you want to increase it by a third over the next 20 to 30 years, which people are expecting to do, we're going to end up using more energy. There is no way that this world can function based on the amount of energies that, that's needed to keep people improving their standard of living, keep people growing their economies without using every form of energy we've got. Some environmentalist campaigns against strip mining and coal-fired power plants have been so successful in swaying public opinion that the coal industry has started to take a more aggressive, visible approach to protect its interests. What you have here are some really committed activists who feel very passionate against coal. And then you have the industry I represent who are excellent at mining coal, but not adept at telling their story. And the industry is uh, playing a very strong defense. Uh, it knows that it is probably more controversial than ever, and it is playing its strongest defense ever. And one of the things that Friends of Coal is trying to do is tell that story. One of the things I'm trying to do is to make sure people understand this is what happens when you talk about restricting coal production. You're going to harm the economy. You're going to harm jobs. You're going to make that electric bill you get once a month go up. The industry's, uh, you know, one reaction is, is this kind of visceral reaction where, where you, you heighten the rhetoric and you go out and you hire PR folks to talk about the importance of coal. Um, and, and, uh, and the other, and I think the, the more reasoned uh, response, is to sit down and figure out ways that you can minimize your footprint uh, and, and to diffuse some of the, the situation. The fact remains, if you use electricity in Kentucky, you're using energy generated from coal. The Commonwealth holds a key place in the U.S. production of coal. Today, the conflicted global energy debate has a very personal nature. Economics, environmental concerns, and technology are colliding with energy needs. With increasing pressures regarding these issues, we have to ask, what is the future of coal? But to fairly discuss that future, we must have the context of the culture and history of this powerful black rock. Almost 300 years ago, deep in the bellies of these mountains, the coal was found that would fuel America's economy and provide a way of life for generations of hard-working people. More than almost any other state, Kentucky's current economy and politics and sociology are influenced by its geology, and coal is probably the most important part of that geology. Well, since the late 1800s, it's been a very significant part of the history of Kentucky, the heritage and, and the development of Kentucky's economic base. If you live in eastern Kentucky, coal plays a part in your everyday life, some way, form, or fashion. Uh, mountain families have great pride in uh, their ancestry and great pride in families. And for individuals who worked in a dangerous ind industry, at little wages to provide income for their families, uh, uh, people are quite proud of that coal mining heritage. Coal miners are, are fiercely independent and, uh, and fiercely proud of what they do. Coal was literally the bedrock of the American Industrial Revolution. 
this rock fuel was integral to the growth of the young country. Uh, the first commercial coal mine in Kentucky was in Muhlenberg County around 1820, but the industry didn't really develop on a major scale until railroads were built into the East Kentucky coal field in the late 19th and early 20th century. That brought in uh, major companies who built uh, company towns and uh, really was the beginning of uh, Kentucky's big time coal industry. Appalachia and Kentucky were about to change forever as mountains, once shielded from mining by lack of access, were now open to opportunity as railroads provided the massive transportation needed to take the abundant black rock out of the hills of Kentucky and feed it to a growing industrialized nation. There were those who understood that there was significant mineral wealth in the Appalachian region. John C. C. Mayo was one of the most famous. John C. C. Mayo, who was a school teacher out of Paintsville, developed a legal instrument known as the broad form deed. He uh, went through the region and, uh, and purchased the mineral rights and, and the landowners in many cases signed with an X because they were not literate. He would in turn sell the land or the rights to the land to Northern Iron and Coal Companies at a considerable profit while convincing them to invest in exploration and mining of the region. By the end of his life, Mayo was a millionaire. There were stories about John C. C. Mayo and his wife going out and she would have silver dollars tucked into the hem of her dress and they would actually, you know, they'd pay them in, in hard cash for these mineral rights and I'm sure the landowners thought, you know, that somebody's given them something for nothing because they weren't aware of the tremendous wealth of the, that, that was beneath their feet. While they enjoyed uh, that immediate benefit, uh, they didn't get uh, much of any royalties. And when large-scale strip mining came along, it gave companies the right to uh, mine in ways that uh, the uh, landowners had never envisioned. And in relative terms, the amounts of money they were paid were relatively high compared to today's economic times. Uh, some points it was 50 cents an acre or a dollar an acre, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in the late 1800s, it was a considerable sum, especially for something you didn't think was worth much. Coal was providing new opportunities for a large number of former farmers as people left their farms to work in the mines. In the city of Lynch, Kentucky, it was one of the largest coal camps that was built. It was really an ideal community at the time. It had more modern conveniences then than the city of Lexington. I grew up here in Lynch, Kentucky. I was uh, born in 1946, and the year I was born, there was 10,000 people that lived in this, this community. Growing up in this little community, it was, uh, it was a tremendous, great childhood. We, uh, United States Steel Corporation owned this, uh, owned this area, and, and they were just, uh, they were a good, good company to work for. To feed the country's hunger for coal, men were needed to extract the precious commodity from its deep hiding places inside the Appalachian Hills. Since mining coal could be an expensive affair, large companies were often the main players in creating mines. They hired workers who would relocate to towns created by the mining companies. Mines were often established in the rugged backwoods, far from regular towns. If we look at the history of coal in Kentucky, we find plenty of evidence uh, uh, that the industry has created great wealth that has been concentrated in the hands of a few, and it has resulted in great distinctions uh, and inequalities Certainly one cannot look at Eastern Kentucky uh, and the persistent poverty of Eastern Kentucky without connecting that to a history that tended to benefit some at the expense of, uh, at the expense of others. Uh, in the early 1900s, uh, some say the, the labor force was exploited. It was almost a captive labor force with all of the immigrants and people that were moved in. Under the leadership of John L. Lewis, the United Mine Workers sought to fight the stronghold the coal companies had on their workers. During that time period of the 1920s, there was a lot of labor strife in the coal fields. As there was a lot of labor strife throughout the country, uh, the United Mine Workers of America moved in to organize the coal fields. A lot of the companies brought in their own guards, uh, Pinkertons, and, and there were pitched battles. Which, uh, Harlan County became known as Bloody Harlan because of the labor strife that was going on. But as federal regulation began to quiet the labor wars, 
new battle lines for the land rights and the environment began to be drawn around the mid-century mark. Coal became an environmental issue when large-scale strip mining became common in eastern Kentucky. Uh, here you had uh, fairly steep slopes uh, that were being mined. You had uh, landslides, uh, water pollution, uh, injuries and deaths as a result, uh, uh, damage to streams uh, and the landscape. And we had a uh, uh, mild strip mining law in 1954, but it really wasn't enforced. Uh, we got a better one in 1966, uh, but uh, with the change of administrations, it wasn't as well enforced as it should have been. And the lack of state enforcement led to the passage of a federal law in 1977. But under the federal law, primary enforcement is largely done by the states. Like I said, when we first started, we were faced with the, a lot of difficulties. We were faced with the states that resented our presence. Uh, they didn't want to be told by the federal government on how to do their job. We were resented by the operators who didn't want to be subject to new and, and more stringent regulations. And they didn't want to be told how to do their job. <laughs> Environmental impact uh, has been reduced uh, by the federal strip mine law, but it's certainly not been eliminated, especially with the advent of large mountaintop mines. The promises of the 1977 law that the mining would be a temporary use of land, that the rights of landowners would be protected, and that the, the environmental consequences of mining would be minimized simply has not been met. We were faced with uh, some elements of the citizenry that, that saw us as a uh, knight on a white horse that, that had expectations of, of our agency that could never be met realistically. In 1979, coal mining provided over 50,000 jobs in Kentucky, with nearly 36,000 of those jobs located in the Appalachian region of the state but primarily due to mechanization. By 1992, mining jobs in eastern Kentucky had fallen below 20,000, and by 2004, only 13,000 remained. Mining jobs have increased somewhat in the last few years due to rising global demand for coal, only to decline during a recession. But even temporary booms in employment have not negated the overall downward trend in mining jobs over the last three decades. Mining employment currently makes up only 1% of total non-farm employment in Kentucky. We have had periods of boom when there have been jobs available, uh, but those periods of boom have always been followed by periods of bust when people have been forced to migrate and to leave. It has not been sustainable. It has not been secure. In eastern Kentucky, the coming of the coal industry and company towns uh, uh, turned a uh, subsistence agrarian uh, kind of economy into uh, an industrial wage-based economy. And uh, that is a recipe for uh, uh, social ferment and uh, uh, economic uh, dislocation and sometimes dysfunction. The extraction techniques have changed. The mining camps have been built and abandoned. The jobs have come and gone, but the Black Rock is still here. And after almost 200 years of searching, digging, and fighting over it, one thing is certain. Coal is not just interwoven in the history, culture, and economy here. It's part of the soul of Kentucky. While we all enjoy the benefits of coal-powered energy, there is no denying that mining and coal use have an environmental impact. Today, coal's impact on the health of both local communities and the physical environment has become a major issue. The impact on the environment is ultimately impact on people. Uh, the kind of air they breathe, the kind of water they drink, the kind of landscape they look at. Throughout the cycle of coal mining, burning, and waste management, there are a variety of impacts on both the environment and human health. But surface mining is definitely one of the most controversial aspects of mining today. A particular concern to many is the form of surface mining called mountaintop removal conducted in the Appalachian region. Critics claim this process destroys not only the beauty of the land, but devastates delicate ecosystems. What I would like to see is a halt to surface mining 
especially radical strip mining such as mountaintop removal. That is just so incredibly destructive. What I would say, it doesn't take a brain surgeon really to figure out the destruction this stuff's doing to our mountain environment. You know, you ask my clients, what are the most significant issues? They're not going to tell you mountaintop removal. They're going to tell you it's the coal trucks. They're going to say it's the water loss that they've suffered. It's a whole gamut of the, of the, the, the different indignities that are suffered by having mines as neighbors. My family's been right here for around 200 years. Uh, we never had problems with water until the mines moved in and started mining. Uh, we've lost six wells on this property. It creates a situation where runoff from rains um, is, is much harder to uh, slow down. It, er, everything picks up speed. It's not just a slogan that we are literally all downstream from this kind of destructive practice. This used to be have minnows, crawdads, salamanders. Uh, there's nothing here now. I'm doing, going to do a conductivity test to look at the heavy metal. The new EPA ruling is 300 is a high level. 500 is, they say, the stream is not repairable. It's too polluted to be repaired with heavy metals. 1,440. That's, that is about what it's running. Um, normally, I'm getting between 1,320 to 1,500. Now this in here, my meter cannot read it because it says over range. This is not the way it used to be. This runs into the Big Sandy, which runs into the Ohio River. Uh, everybody's drinking water source is coming from here. This is where the water begins. And people don't realize that the water that comes from the headwater streams in the coal fields in a few counties in eastern Kentucky actually feed three major rivers, uh, including the watershed of uh, Lexington, central Kentucky. Anybody that comes here and sees really what's happening to these people would pay a little bit more for electric to, to stop this that's going on and have it done properly. Proponents believe the land can not only be restored, but can actually be restored to a better purpose. We feel like we can restore land to a usable condition. And EPA studies have shown that the actual footprint of mining in the Appalachian region is very small, uh, not just for the mountaintop removal, but for all mining. Uh, even though we still have too much, the streams degraded. There's people fishing in streams that, that used to be degraded. Uh, there are lands that are being used uh, productively, both for private use and public use. Every year we're seeing more and more developments take place on mined areas, uh, older mined areas, for moving housing out of the floodplain, uh, actually moving commercial areas out of the floodplain, moving high schools and, uh, and prisons and other public facilities to higher elevations. There are a lot of reclamation successes out there. Uh, and the opponents of mountaintop removal uh, say that's just putting lipstick on a corpse. Once the coal has been mined and delivered to a power plant, the next phase of the process involves burning. Coal is the most carbon intensive of all fossil fuels and is responsible for nearly 40% of America's CO2 emissions. That's why the development of technologies to reduce this carbon emission is a high priority for the future of coal in Kentucky. In addition to carbon emissions, burning coal also generates other potentially toxic substances. Considering the amount of coal mined and used in Kentucky, a balance must be considered between energy, environment, and quality of life. How can we successfully manage our energy and economic needs while preserving a healthy environment? The reasoning and messages for all sides of this issue become more and more amplified as the stakes continue to rise. The Turk plant was designed with carbon capture and storage in mind. 
It is cleaner, it's more efficient, and it's much better for the environment. We have to plan for the long term. That's what we believe we're doing with the advancement of clean coal technology, building a way to the future. To see all the ads from the industry about clean coal, uh, you'd think uh, we've already uh, uh, accomplished this great technological breakthrough. We have not. Clean coal technology is an oxymoron. Coal is not clean. Clean coal is probably an unfortunate term. There, there's virtually no such thing as a clean energy. And what's now being termed as clean coal is developing cleaner ways to mine, burn, utilize coal. The world's changing attitudes towards energy sources have major implications for Kentucky and its coal industry. Concerns about climate change are driving policy that favors cleaner energy sources and increasing fossil fuel prices. The voices for change and technological solutions are coming from the highest levels. The, the impression originally was given that, you know, this is no problem, we can do this which we can do this, the no problems, the, the, the harder part. Um, yes, it is being done and it is being developed and we can do it, uh, it's just at what cost. And so we have to have solutions for how do we live with what we have now and how do we use newer, better technology to move forward. Uh, and all of that, we have to look at what's the cost benefit to that. At some point, we will have to find other solutions for our energy consumption. Mm -hmm. And the time to start is now. The transition to cleaner, sustainable forms of energy is a major economic driver. Kentucky, like other states, is moving to develop, produce, and install the energy technologies of the future. But with the long legacy of reliance on coal for jobs and electricity, Kentucky faces major challenges. We have to learn to live within our means ecologically. And we have, um, we have over the, the past century um, been on a fossil fueled binge. And unfortunately, the, 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 we're now looking at the tab for that binge. We want to continue to make that uh, extraction process uh, more environmentally uh, benign, uh, make it a uh, cleaner process, making it a more environmentally friendly process. For many Kentucky residents, any solution to the problems of using coal for energy can't come soon enough. But the reality of reducing the impact of coal mining and coal usage is complex. Solutions will not come quickly, cheaply, or easily. The power and future of coal have elevated the Black Rock to a global topic, and for good reason. It provides over a fourth of the world's primary energy needs and generates over 40% of the world's electricity. As a major coal producing state, Kentucky operates in a global market. Somewhere around 50% of the states uh, in the United States uh, get more than 50% of their energy uh, from uh, burning coal. So it's not just in Kentucky, it's a, a significant source of electricity for many states. Coal continues to be a significant part of the Commonwealth's economy. In 2006, the Kentucky coal industry paid over $1 billion in direct wages, directly employing almost 18,000 persons, and brought in over $3.5 billion out-of-state dollars through coal sales to customers in 30 other states and four foreign countries, although some of that income passes into the hands of companies held in other states. Kentucky coal companies paid over $220 million in coal severance taxes in fiscal year 2006-2007. Well, I can tell you that on uh, every ton of coal that's mined, that there is a tax of 4.5%. When that money comes into the state, 50% of it goes into the general fund, and the other 50% is returned back to the coal counties through a formula. When you look at where we are today and where we have been, uh, it has been energy that has got us there, and coal has been a big part of that equation. However, recent trends in the coal market and its future economic impact on the mining industry have raised questions regarding the value of coal for Kentucky's economy. It's estimated that 1 to 3 percent of Kentucky's gross state product comes from coal. From 2000 to 2008, coal's share of the GSP declined by more than a fourth 
share of state employment is less than 1%. In spite of that, Kentucky's manufacturing base relies heavily on the low-cost electricity generated from coal. Kentucky produces a smaller share of the nation's coal than before, but still ranks third overall. Yes, coal is a global issue, but our place in the global economy is reliant on coal as well. Coal mining provides the basis for the rest of Kentucky's economy. Kentucky would not be the third leading auto manufacturer in the country or the leading producer of aluminum if it was not for the low cost electricity that Kentucky coal provides. And with cheap energy alternatives in other countries, there is always the possibility of losing jobs associated with these industries if energy prices were higher. Additionally, for every one mining job, every one miner, it's estimated at least three other jobs are dependent on that miner. So anytime you're talking about a loss of mining jobs, you're talking about a much greater economic and employment impact on Kentucky. The reason mining jobs account for a large percentage of county wages is not because they're so numerous, but because other jobs are so scarce. So I think you have to consider all of those aspects when you look at the economics of Kentucky coal. Uh, coal is the most uh, important part of Kentucky's uh, natural resource extraction economy. If we build an economy just upon an economy of extraction, uh, it tends not to build a sustainable economy, uh, and it tends not to build a developed economy. People's sense of worth and what's important about their place is tied to the economy. So it's like if the economy is shaped by taking things out, putting them on a truck or a train and shipping them away, <laughs> and living with the environmental and the health impacts of those challenges, I think there are challenges to people's sense of self related to what it means to live in the mountains. Even today, coal remains an iconic symbol of the state's economy. Mining jobs have provided good wages and opened up economic opportunities for generations of Kentucky families, bringing prosperity to some in a region with historically high poverty rates. What's, what's important to remember about uh, coal and the Kentucky economy is that uh, it's an essential part of many local economies. It's the only uh, good paying job other than teaching school uh, in a lot of counties. As far as the employees themselves, uh, these are employees that are often making more than $60,000 a year. They've got great health benefits. They are often living in rural areas of Kentucky where there aren't any other opportunities. For us at Riverview, we feel very fortunate that we were able to provide these 600 jobs during a time when most of the country and even most of the states going through a recession. It was huge for me, I mean, especially for me losing that job. I mean. I mean, it gave us a source of income and a source to, you know, to support my kid and give him things that I didn't, didn't get when I was a kid. And it's huge, huge. A coal mine is, is giving my family more stability than, than what I had. And, you know, just giving us more opportunity to succeed as a family. However, according to Justin Maxson of MACED, the Mountain Association for Community Economic Development, recent trends in the coal market and its future economic impact on the mining industry tell a less optimistic story. The piece of research that, that we did recently in 2009 about the economics of coal was trying to look at a narrow slice of that question and really ask what's, what's the economic impact of coal on the budget. In the year that we looked at all of the income, so income taxes to the state from coal and all of the other revenues in terms of fees, etc., and then we looked at those same costs, the industry was a net cost to the state, not a gain. Clearly there are other challenges that have made the economy and economic development of Appalachia hard. And it's not only coal, but the politics of coal and the history of economic development and the role that coal has played is unique. Critics argue that the report does not adequately account for some important aspects, while including other, less relevant information. The research presented by MACID does underscore the need for more study on the economic impact of coal and mining in the state. Some of the skeptics about coal uh, say that it has inhibited non-coal development in the coal field uh, of Appalachia. Uh, I think that is probably true in some cases. 
but there's not uh, a great deal of research to actually establish that. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, though, and there probably has not been the kind of attention uh, locally and at the state level to developing non-coal jobs in the eastern Kentucky coal field. We keep throwing ourselves at big manufacturers to try to attract them to the state, and and we we uh, we ignore in doing that that most of the growth occurs from investment and growth in small businesses. We, we still aren't where we need to be. There's absolutely no question about that. But we're beginning to bring in additional uh, uh, industries. Uh, we are beginning to strengthen the existing industries uh, outside of coal that we have. We're working on things like uh, cultural tourism and uh, ecotourism uh, that we think can sustain us for some time to, to come. Kentucky's competitiveness in the coal industry has declined in recent years, losing market share both in Kentucky and in surrounding states. In 1992, 82% of coal used in Kentucky was supplied by producers within the state. Nearly 10 years later, that number had fallen to 60%. Kentucky's share of the Kentucky coal market declined as other states increased their shipments of coal to the state. West Virginia, Colorado, and Wyoming gain the most ground in Kentucky markets during this period. I mean, Western coal has gained dominance, uh, uh, the dominance that used to be Central Appalachian coal because it is so inexpensive to mine. Um, and it is being shipped uh, across the country now, uh, burned in places that used to burn coal from, from Kentucky. Um, but uh, the, the, the high BTU content is what's sort of maintaining the market uh, for Central Appalachian coal. In the West, uh, they can mine that coal very easily. I mean, these coal seams are 100 feet thick, all right? So it's unbelievable uh, how easy it is to extract that coal. However, from a quality perspective, when you take a look at uh, Ill, you know, Kentucky coal, well, our coal is high in BTU. I mean, it's um, maybe not twice to BTU, but it's certainly a much, much higher in BTU content. And uh, as a result, you know, uh, you get a much more efficient burn with Kentucky coal. But the final considerations about this black rock must include the number of people in Kentucky who live, work, go to school and play as a result of the electrical energy provided by coal. Currently, coal provides over 90% of the fuel for energy for over 4 million people in the state. From agriculture, to automobiles, from schools, to hospitals, all depend on electricity. The question Kentuckians have to consider is, what's the value of coal in the Commonwealth? The rapid and dramatic changes in the world's growing need for energy have major implications for Kentucky and its coal industry. If they don't figure out a way to capture and sequester carbon dioxide from burning coal, the industry is in terrible trouble in the long term. And in some places, maybe in trouble in the short term. When you realize that 50% of all the electricity in the United States comes from coal, it would be almost impossible to replace that with renewables. While research continues in the areas of biofuels, natural gas, and solar, it's unlikely fossil energy will leave the energy scene quickly. But the future of cleaner, more efficient coal in Kentucky depends on the development of several key technologies. You've heard the expression of the clean coal technologies, and whether you like that term or not and want to argue about whether it's clean or cleaner or whatever, um, that term does sort of capture what, what research is going on now. We're looking at how do we continue to use this resource with a lessening impact on the environment. Some of the bigger issues that we're facing are what do we do with the carbon dioxide that comes from the utilization of coal, uh, as well as some of the solid wastes. There is great uncertainty around the concept of clean coal. There are calls for the coal industry to devote significant resources for the commercial scale development of integrated carbon capture, transport, and sequestration systems. But the timeline for this commercialization is uncertain. Well, if you're looking at carbon capture storage, I don't believe we're really going to see uh, commercial utilization of carbon capture storage until about 2018. Technology is an answer, 
but there has to be reasonable expectations uh, with the time to, to develop that technology. And I think you got to balance the cost of that technology uh, with what you know the uh, the benefits you're trying to, to accrue. The primary difficulty is cost. You know, you're talking about adding uh, uh, significantly uh, to the cost of a power plant if you have to capture and then sequester the CO2. To separate the gas at the power plant and to collect the CO2, capture it, is expensive. And of course, then to uh, put it under pressure and pump it down, and then you would have a forever uh, monitoring responsibility to be sure that everything is safe. So this whole process will definitely add to the cost of using coal power. There's a pilot plant uh, in West Virginia that appears to be uh, more economical than they expected, but it's still going to add substantially to the cost. Mm -hmm. And that has to be passed along to people who use electricity. But what we need to do is to send a clear message to the marketplace that all forms of energy have a footprint and that that footprint has to be accounted for in the pricing of that energy. That's why the science of clean coal technology is a major focus for researchers. CO2 sequestration, or carbon capture, is one of the key areas currently being researched at the Center for Applied Energy Research at the University of Kentucky. CCS, carbon capture and sequestration, is sort of the shorthand. Um, a lot of people also say carbon capture and storage. After we capture the carbon, which is really necessary, it's the first half of the process. We get this into a liquid, we transport it to where we want to sequester it, and that really means uh, putting it into a holding area. We usually think about geologic sequestration where we're going to put it underground into a reservoir that will keep it there. Uh, that may be either an active or a played out oil field, uh, gas field, uh, or just into you know open pore space underground. Well, UK, with uh, several industry partners and with the state, Energy and Environment Cabinet drilled a hole in Hancock County to a depth of 8,126 feet. The point of drilling this pilot hole was to pump CO2 into the formation to see if it would accept CO2 under pressure, and it did. This is the second phase of UK's carbon storage research program. In 2009, 300 tons of CO2 were pumped into this test well. The results have been encouraging. Roughly one-third of the United States carbon emissions are emitted from coal-fired power plants. To stabilize and ultimately reduce concentrations of this greenhouse gas, it is necessary to employ CCS, carbon capture and storage technology. CO2 actually uh, occurs in the, in the rock formations naturally. So when we do sequestration, we're not doing anything a lot different than what nature does in other places. Environmentalists who oppose coal mining and coal energy also worry that sequestration could simply trade one problem, climate change, for another one, water pollution. Should the carbon dioxide mix with water underground and form carbonic acid, it could leach poisonous materials from rock deep underground that could then seep out to precious water supplies. You put carbon, you put gases down in the ground, they're gonna surface somewhere else. I, I seriously doubt you can't sequester uh, carbon. And when you put a gas like CO2 to the depth that they're considering, you um, look at the overlying formations and make sure that some of those overlying formations have the properties that will seal, then um, that's how they're going to ensure that it's going to stay down there. But you know, just because we're putting a lot of energy into this, doesn't mean that it will work. You know, I mean, we put a lot of energy into the fight against cancer. We put billions and billions of dollars in death rates basically the same as it was 20 years ago. I mean, this, it's not a sure thing just because we spend $3.4 billion in the Climate Security Act on carbon capture and storage that we're gonna figure it out. We may very well not. But capturing carbon dioxide from the burning of coal is not the only way to develop cleaner energy. Another area at the forefront of research is to literally feed the CO2 to algae to accelerate the development of alternative biofuels. Algae are among the fastest growing plants in the world. Given the right conditions, algae can double in volume overnight. Unlike other biofuel feedstocks such as soy or corn, 
It can also be harvested day after day. Up to 50% of algae's body weight is comprised of oil, whereas oil palm trees, currently the largest producer of oil for biofuels, yield about 20% of their weight in oil. Soy produces some 50 gallons of oil per acre per year, canola 150 gallons, and palm 650 gallons. But algae is expected to produce 10,000 gallons per acre per year, and eventually even more, making it a significant potential renewable energy source. Another important energy concern that coal and technology may be able to address is America's dependency on foreign oil. I think it's a national security issue to the point of it's here, we own it, we can produce it, and, and it has a historical significance. And I think it's going to be necessary to carry us into the next uh, two generations. Researchers are seeking ways to more efficiently turn coal into liquid fuel through the fischer tropsch process. Could the future of fuel production lie in a secret unlocked by German scientists during World War II? Today, the Center for Applied Energy is advancing this technology with a fischer tropsch plant, currently the largest open access coal to liquids testing and development lab in the world. Coal to liquid products are versatile. CTL fuels can be used to run a variety of vehicles, including cars, trucks, tanks, and jets. But there are challenges. Carbon dioxide, a leading cause of climate change, is released when coal is liquefied and again when the CTL fuel is burned. In order for CTL products to enter the mainstream as a viable source of transportation fuel, scientists and researchers believe they must find a way to limit carbon dioxide emissions. Another factor, building a coal to liquids plant can cost billions of dollars. While uncertainty remains about future energy sources, one goal is clear, advanced technological solutions must be found in order to answer the growing concerns of both energy needs and the environmental and human impact of coal. The issue is not, I think, uh, whether coal will be part of our environment in the future, but how do we use the public resources which are currently uh, sustaining our coal-based economy to build an alternative economy. It has to get more efficient. It has to change. <laughs> There's no way we can go on like this. There's a finite amount of coal. There's a finite amount of natural gas, and that's all there is. The best strategy for survival is moving forward and embracing change and saying, okay, you know what? We're not doing it that way anymore. I live in eastern Kentucky. My people settled that land. I love that land. I, I live there. Uh, I think we've got to strike a balance for my people to have quality of life, to have a job. What there won't be is one replacement to coal employment. It's really a question of silver BBs, not a silver a bullet. And that that's harder to do, right? If there was a replacement, we would have done it. It's too precious a resource for us to waste the way we do. We have a great resource. We have a, a vast amount of coal available to us domestically in our state. It can be a driver in our economy, and it has been. Uh, but we want to make sure that we don't you know, use it unwisely. The use of our cell phones or every new gadget that we get every year at Christmas increases the demand for electricity. Uh, there's no question in my mind energy growth is going to continue. And with the finite amount of energy we have from all sources, we need everything. The questions we ask today often lead to only more questions tomorrow. The worlds of science and education continue to work and explore alternatives and solutions. The summits, the experiments, the laws, the testing, and the questions continue. All compounded by scale, impact, demand, and time. Until we have that mutual respect from all sides of the discussion, we are not going to have a suitable and, and rewarding conversation. I think it's unfortunate that people position this as an us versus them in the media because I'm very uh, sympathetic to what the coal miners have to deal with. 
to develop the new technologies, to implement the new technologies that we need and the next generation needs as energy sources, we're going to have to work together and transition from what we have now to what we need in the future. It's a marvelous opportunity. Uh, people need to keep current on these issues because they are constantly being debated in the public policy arena. And in a democracy, people who have the facts ought to have power. Unfortunately, sometimes the facts take a back seat to opinion and lobbying and influence. I think if people can focus on getting the facts and keeping them current, that will lead to good policy.